The world is heading towards destruction. Does Islam Ahmadiyyat have all the answers? Welcome to Inside Ahmadiyya. نزل المهدي فينا مرحبا شمس الزمان فأقام الدين شرعا للذي يبغي الجنان Welcome to Inside Ahmadiyyad, the program in which we promote the living beauty of Islam Ahmadiyyad and also along the way answer any allegations or questions you may have. To help me in the studio today for this discussion, we have our fellow missionary brothers, Abdul Qudus Arif Sahib and Atal Fatir Sahib. As salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Now, social media, like everything, has its ups and downs. Even we are using a social media platform today to get this message across to you, to promote the beautiful teachings of Islam to you. Because for us, by accepting the promised Messiah Islam, it is as if we found gold. And we want to share this wealth with the world. Because we, and Ahmadis across the world, are experiencing firsthand the comfort, satisfaction and peace that you get by accepting the Messiah and being obedient to our beloved Master, the Holy Prophet And by doing so, we found purpose. And you don't have to look far for proof. Ahmadis across the world who are facing severe persecution and in some cases being martyred, like in Burkina Faso, Nine of our brave Ahmadi brothers were brutally martyred, one after the other. And these were all new converts, by the way, who were so at peace and content that they had found their purpose in life that they couldn't turn their backs on it. And when asked to renounce Ahmadiyyat if they want to live, they said, no, how can we stand against the truth? And this is exactly in accordance to what our beloved master, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu stated with regards to recognizing the truthful Jamaat in the latter days. He said that their experiences will resemble ours. And we find in history that this is exactly what the companions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ went through. However, social media also has its downside. We can't forget that at the end of the day, it's a business. And people use this as a tool to create revenue. And these so-called scholars and content creators, on one hand they say that Ahmadis are not Muslims and we cannot have them have the kalama on the walls of their mosque. In fact, they, we can't even call them a mosque. It's not a mosque. You shouldn't meet with them, you shouldn't sit with them, do not associate yourselves with them. Yet on the other hand, they are very quick to put our names in their videos because they know this will get them views and they use it as clickbait. And they do this to generate more income. And this is the reality. Even our children, even our children can easily recognize the truth. And they don't fall for fairy tales. They understand the difference between what's reality and what's not. However, this is also a sign of the truth mentioned in the prophecy by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu that a time will come that nothing will be left of the Quran except of its, for its script, text. And that's exactly what's happening now. Some content creators and these so-called scholars, their service to the Quran is very superficial. They are stuck on the outer shell and they've not come to the beauty and actual essence of the Quran. They're not concerned about how best to understand these beautiful teachings and implement them into our lives or how best to make people relate to this message as it's for the whole world. And when we talk about service to the Quran, even the Ottoman Empire, as great and powerful as they were, they weren't able to translate the Quran. And our Jamaat, which was established by a Punjabi prophet under divine leadership, not only have translated the Quran in 70 plus languages, but published and distributed and is prioritizing its distribution across the world. And that's what true service is. Now, last week, on last week's show, we spoke about how we are Muslims. There's no ifs or buts about it. Alhamdulillah, we are Muslims. But this week, the first question I want to pose to Qudu Sahib, that why are we promoting Islam? Why Islam? What's so special about Islam? Usman, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Usman, you mentioned right at the beginning that the world is at a precipice. You know, we see so much doom and gloom uh, across the world, across society. Systems are failing, man-made systems are failing. You know, you look at, well, the economic systems, they're failing, governments are failing. There's far-right extremism on the co constantly increasing. You see domestic violence, domestic issues constantly increasing. And there's just air of intolerance. And it's because, you know, society, the world has moved far away from God Almighty, from its creator. 
So we're saying that religion is the answer to these, all these issues. And of course, the religion that we promote and we say is Islam. <coughs> Islam is the sole religion in this very, very age and day that can kind of give you salvation and save you from these doom and gloom. And just a few years ago, we've literally come out of the pandemic, Osman. COVID, when it was there, we kind of, humans had a reset moment. Yeah. And we kind of experienced how helpless we as a species are. And it's only God Almighty's grace and mercy that can truly kind of save you from such calamities. And we short-lived that moment. Yeah. And now we've come back into our old ways. And, you know, in certain cases, we've gone even worse than our, you know, pre-COVID times. But Islam's teaching is all about being close to the fitra. It's made with the fitra. It's made with the nature of man. I just want to give two examples uh, for, for our audience today. The first example is, I mentioned the Holy Quran. It speaks about, and it's from Surah, Surah Taha, so chapter 20, verse 132. And I'll present the translation. Hopefully, we can see it in the screen, on the screen right now. And strain not your eyes after what we have bestowed on some classes of them to enjoy for a short time the splendor of the present world, that we may try them thereby. Now, here's something which is so relevant to us, that this small teaching that don't look at other people covetously, you know, look what they have, you know, on their plate, look what they have, what possessions they have, what material possessions they have, what car they're driving, what house they have, you know, or what watch they're wearing, right? But focus on yourself. That's the key thing. Now, if you apply this teaching, not just on an individual basis, but you apply it on a national basis or international basis, that don't look at other people's resources. Stick to what you have. And God Almighty has provided resources and sustenance to everyone across the world. So if we're happy, if we become Ganaat if Basan, we, if we're happy with what we have, what God's endowed us, then we'll have so, solved so many issues in society, so many issues on an international scale. The second point that Islam focuses on so much is establishing justice on all fronts. Now, this seems like a very, you know, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's a soundbite, justice, yeah. You know, we can establish peace and justice on the world. But that's actually what the reality is. Islam teaches that even if you have to bear witness against your parents, your dear ones, don't hesitate to do it. If your rights are going in order to establish the rights of others, that's what justice is about. Again, if this is implemented on our own spheres, in our own lives, in our own professional lives, in our own educational lives, and then that ripple effect that the society is establishing justice and then that kind of goes on to the national front internationally. The whole purpose of the UN being established, the League of Nations being established after the World War II, was so that peace can prevail in society, peace can, peace can prevail across the world. But it's failed drastically because there's no justice within that system as well. You see, nations have been given, granted veto power, certain nations, and other nations are just, you know, bystanders. They can present the best of thing for the world, but a superpower can just veto it without any explanation. There are certain members of the security councils, right, that are permanent members, but other countries which don't have any say. Where's the justice in that? So Islam says, establish justice on all spheres, on all fronts, and you'll see a change, a, a change in, in, in the way the world functions. And you, eventually you'll see a, a change in the world and peace in the world. And this is something that His Holiness, Mr. Masur Ahmed, may Allah strengthen his hand, has been promoting since the very day you know, he came into the office of Khilafat. It's been 20 years, by God's grace, glorious 20 years, right? And you pick up anything, any of his speech, any of his address, one thing is prevalent, that if we establish justice on this, on this earth, you know, if we have, then we'll have peace, inner peace, and we'll have peace for others as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of things come to mind from what you just said. One, it's um, from a young age, we're told that if you remember God in a time of ease, he'll remember you in a time of hardship. You mentioned COVID, and I remember there was a research done that during COVID, it was a, um, I think Google, the search of Google with regards to God, it had just it gone up extravagantly, it increased, which just shows that when people go through difficulty, they do turn to God. It does, you know, in the West, it's a very hedonistic, materialistic, a society which we're living in right and like you said people are going to come to the fitra they are going to come to human nature and we're at this point this tipping point where people are realizing that this materialism it's not going to get us very far and the solution which 
our khulafa giving again and again is Islam. Islam will take you um, to that spiritual height, which actually your fitrah, your nature is looking for. And the interesting thing is that it's not the Islam of the non-Ahmadi Muslim Islam. So many yeah. people who come to our events, externals, they say that, you know what, the Islam you present, your Khalifa presents, that's something that is more amenable yeah, to us. Exactly. We can accept it. We can see ourselves living and abiding by those laws and, and regulations. And it's not an Islam which is separate from the Holy Prophet. Because, you know, a lot of people like saying you guys twist Islam. It's the Islam yeah. that the Prophet exactly. taught. That's what our Khulafa teach today as well. So, like we mentioned a number of times, this is a live program. We want you to send in your questions, any allegations you may have heard, so we can address them. And we've received a question, actually, it's in line with the discussion we're just having now. Mm -hmm. And the question is from Charles Razak. Um, thank you for getting in touch. The question is, if Islam is the remedy for the world crisis, why are Muslim countries going through so much tribulations and anguish, especially Muslim-denominated countries in Africa? This is a prophecy of the Holy Prophet He said that this time will come um, when there would be a very, very tough time on the Muslim Ummah. And interestingly, he said during that time, the Imam Mahdi and Isa will come. We believe to be one person that is Hazrat Mizawullah Muhammad alayhi salam. And so we've seen, interestingly, if you look at the course of history, since Hazrat Mizawullah Muhammad alayhi salam came, and since his time, look at the Muslim countries, and look at Ahmadiyyad separately. The Muslim countries have declined further and further, whether geopolitically, whether spiritually, whether economically, whether morally, and Muslims themselves are saying this, right? They're saying that, in fact, there's even people on social media who are saying that, you know, the Times are telling us that all the minor signs for the Mahdi and the Isa, they've come true. There's immorality in the world, there's sin, um, people are going away from Islam, atheism spreading, there's technological advancements and Islam's going down and down. They're, they're saying that the Mahdi should be here, that saviour who the Holy Prophet said would come, should have come. On the other hand, we have the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat, which was created by Hazim Izzullah Muhammad alayhi salam, and the people who are accepting, you know, they, they're coming in like magnet attracts um, iron. They're coming in and they are finding that spiritual peace, um, the peace within their lives as well and this body of Muslims is growing and growing and growing but if uh, that's the issue if Muslim countries Muslim people Muslim leaders don't accept the Imam of the age who taught the true Islam of what we should be practicing and how we should be practicing Islam who revived Islam then this situation of the Muslim world it's not going to get any better the thing is Usman following on from Fatih the Ummah it's not helping itself. Yeah. Right? We're two billion people, right? Yeah. We're a force to reckon with over 40 Muslim nations, yeah. right? Why are people, other nations, are able to go crush other Muslim nations? Or why are Muslim countries attacking other Muslim countries? Where's the justice in that? So we're not helping our own cause. Whereas as Masiyam the of the Islam and his Khulafa have categorically said that, look, you have so much might and power, right? Unite together. Yeah. We will support you. Right? We will be coming, we'll, we, we're there, we'll be the first ones to extend our hand. But we, what we're, we're so bogged down in issuing fatwas of disbelief against one another, and that's all we've been doing for the last, you know, so many centuries. So, of course there will be a decline. Of course, you know, other countries, and Allah, Allah, Allah has made a simple rule. Those that seek and those that are work hard, Allah will reward them. And so you see Western nations, they're progressing because they've worked hard for it. You know, Allah Ta'ala is just as well. Allah Ta'ala will, you know, honour those people that are working hard. But we're not helping our own cause. Okay, like we said, we're receiving a um, number of questions. Yeah. Um, one question uh, someone asked, and again, I'm going to mention it now because we briefly spoke on it last week as well, and it's about the Kalma. So one question, uh, I believe it's a, a question. Can we hear the question, please? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My question is, many of our Sunni Muslims in college believe that our kalma is different to theirs, but we know that it's the same. Could you clarify what we mean when we say the kalma? Jazakumullah. Like you said in your question, our kalma is the same. Kalma for us is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And we spoke about this briefly last week, but Fatih Sab, if you could please tell us what, it, what we mean when we say this kalma. Before I get to that, this issue of 
Ahmadis have a different kalima. Ahmadis have a different Quran. Ahmadis have a different way of praying. It's all due to the Muslim ulama who are misguiding the youth. And the youth are listening to them, you know, like blind sheep. And then that's what they believe. They say that you have a different Quran. We spoke about how they think Tadhkira, which came after Hazim is a compilation of his visions and dreams and revelations. They say that's your Quran. And it's because the Muslim ulama are feeding this to them. And we know this because these videos are on social media. They're present and we can listen to them. They're blatantly lying to them. And it's sad that, you know, in this age where we're told to critically think as well. And in fact, the Quran says to ponder and to check everything properly, that people are just like blind sheep listening to this. Secondly, what do we believe in terms of the kalima? The kalima isn't just some statement which anyone can lightly make. It's, it has a very deep meaning to it. And just two days ago, our Khalifa Hazim Izzah Masru Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, he gave a whole Friday sermon talking about the Kalima Tayyibah and what La ilaha illallah actually means. And he said that, look, La ilaha illallah, someone can say it like a parrot, but it won't, it doesn't mean anything. La ilaha illallah should create a revolution within someone. All the darknesses they had, all the immoralities they had, should transfer and they should become a spiritual being who, are, who is truly close to Allah. La ilaha illallah, he explained that there's so, it's not just there's an idol, a literal idol of a God. There's so many idols within us. Hatred, the idol of jealousy, the idol, the idol of um, uh, being arrogant. All these kind of immoralities are actually idols within us. And by saying la ilaha illallah, we say that we are crushing all these idols, we're creating this revolution within ourselves, and we're becoming better human beings. As Imam Muhammad explained, for example, in light of the writings of the Promised Messiah, he explained that even atheists, philosophers, who you know, arrogantly claim that we don't believe in God, even they have idols within, them, within themselves. And those idols are, is their arrogance, is their arrogance, um, and ignorance on their own knowledge, so on and so forth. But to you know, put it in a few words, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah isn't just something to be taken lightly. It has very strong implications. And those implications are that we create a spiritual change within ourselves and we truly destroy the idols within ourselves. It's so true what you say, because I remember when I was in secondary school, actually, yeah. I got into an argument with a Sunni Muslim who kept calling me a kafir. And when I said, look, on what basis are you calling me a kafir? And his only reply was, well, because my imam told us in the mosque. Exactly. And we know that you can't lie when you're standing in the mosque. You know, that the, was the basis of his argument. This is the reason why when we say inside Ahmadiyya, you have to disconnect for these, from these ulama. These ulama who the Holy Prophet وسلم, said that they're, man tahta dimisma, they're the worst of creation under the sky because of what they're doing, right? And so I, I really urge, especially these Western Muslim youth who are watching, to disconnect for a second from your ulama, go to Ahmadis, ask Ahmadis yourself, and you'll see their blatant lies. We're getting a number of questions, and we want to try and fit all of these questions in. I'm going to read the next question out. We received this from Musavar Maksud uh, from WhatsApp. His question is, as Ahmadis, when we interpret, it, interpret the Quran, it is seen as changing the word of God yeah. or interpreting it to suit our narrative. And he gave an example. He said, for example, the miracles that have been mentioned in the Quran, should, they should be taken literally as they are the word of God and they should not be changed. Okay, just quickly, uh, two, three points. First of all, Hazim is a Ghulam Ahmed salam, and all of his khulafa have come to get rid of the shameful and dishonorable aspects which Muslims have concocted or thought of or written about in terms of the Holy Quran. For example, when Hazim is a Ghulam Ahmed salam, claimed, he said that there has been no verse of the Holy Quran which has been abrogated from the bar of Bismillah to the scene of surah, from Surah An-Nas beginning to the end, not even a dot has been abrogated where other Muslim ulama were saying 500 verses have been abrogated, 50, 5. He said, no, there's, n there's no such thing as that because Allah says that this is for all times and for all people. Another example, during the time, for example, we talk about death of Jesus a lot. Hazim is a during his time was telling the Muslim ulama that the Christians are saying that the Holy Prophet is dead, buried in the ground. Whereas you also believe that Isa ibn Maryam is alive next to God on the throne. 
right? And this, in this tactful manner, the Christian missionaries were converting Muslims in their hundreds of thousands into Christianity. Hazrat Mizu Ghulam Ahmad Islam proved from the Holy Quran that Jesus has died, like all other prophets, right? Inni mutawafika, he said that this is clear, clearly towards death, not towards sleep or for some other meaning. And we see today that actually it's the other non ahmadi Muslim ulama who are changing the meanings, which are very clear through Arabic lexicon as well. Another example which he gave, for example, the, about the death of Jesus is Ma Muhammadun illa rasul qad khalat min qablihi rasul. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is nothing but a Prophet of Allah, all prophets before him have died. In this way, he gave the true meanings of the Holy Quran. Finally, on this miracle aspect, we don't reject miracles, right? We accept miracles. In fact, our community is a community which shows the miracles as well, right? Hazrat Masih Imad Islam, his Khulafa have shown endless amount of miracles. Now, when it comes to the Holy Quran, there are certain places where Muslims have misunderstood miracles. I'm going to give you one example. One example is that Allah says that Isa salam, used to create um, birds. Now we can't take this to be a literal meaning. Why? Because there is no sharik, there's no partner of Allah in his creation. Right? Allah says in Surah Rad, that Allah is the person who creates everything. So these kind of contradictions, we then explain that what the verse actually, what that miracle actually means, right? So th there's a lot more that can be added. Yeah, um, plenty, plenty more. Um, just taking the look of Hazrat Abraham, you mentioned birds, right? One verse of the Holy Quran, you know, Allah Ta'ala uh, directs Hazrat Abraham, you take four birds, right? Yeah. And play, uh, it, the, the words are used that just make them into pieces and place them in different places and then call them towards you, they'll come running towards you. Now, if we take that literally as the words are said, it becomes, a, it becomes comical. Yeah, yeah. Right? There are explanations to it. What, does, what do birds do? Just as spirituality is linked with flying high and going and seeing Allah Ta'ala, that's what birds refer to. And the explanations that our Hazrat Masih Mother Allah Salaam, some of the Promised Messiah and his Khulafa subsequently have given, they've made the Quran accessible to us and exactly. not comical. Exactly. Why you know, are we bent upon making our book, our noble Quran, Right, which is perfect in all of its form, a thing of a uh, thing, a, a thing a of comic, a mockery. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's on this point. There's so many Muslims in the West who are leaving Islam, having doubts about Islam, really deep yeah. doubts about Islam, because of these things that don't make any sense whatsoever. And they're they're right. They, it doesn't make sense, and there's an explanation to this. But this is bound to happen because Allah Taala says that only those people that are cleansed by Himself were the ones that can interpret yeah. the Holy Quran. I guess so it shows you that there needs to be someone who can interpret the Holy Quran. Yeah. We've accepted that person, as a Messiah of the Lesson of Islam. You show us. One thing, um, Usman said that the miracles, we do accept miracles. Hazim is Ghulam Ahmad Islam, he accepted miracles. He said that they did happen. That's why Allah, you know, differentiates between the prophets and their enemies. But there's certain places where that understanding amongst Muslims of the miracle is going against the word of Allah itself. You know, keeping in mind what we just said and how knowing that Islam was perfected through the Quran and the noble character of our beloved Master, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and it's given us um, every teaching to, and shown us how we can succeed in life. I guess the next question is then, why do we insist the need of the Imam Mahdi? It's a very valid question, but it's basically been answered by the Holy Quran itself. And the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam words, right. they both allude to the coming of a Prophet, a Messiah, a Mahdi. You know, remember when Surah Jummah was being revealed to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, when the words were وَآخِرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يُلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ that there will be others amongst you who will be joined with you. And the Sahaba, the companions of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who were sitting there, they thought that who are these people who are going to come after us yet they're going to join us as well. And one Sahabi specifically asked again, you know, the Sahaba asked two or three times which meant that the Holy Prophet was himself waiting for an answer from Allah Ta'ala. This was his practice. Yeah. And then <coughs> the Holy Prophet replied, right, That when the Iman, when faith will go up to the heavens, to, to the Pleiades, to a far distant place, there will be a person 
who will bring it back onto the face Hazrat from the start. And then he, he put his hand, he's putting his hand on the shoulder of Hazrat Salman Farsi, the only Ajmi, the only non Arab present there. Right? Which showed you that there was going to be, the Iman was going to go and someone had to bring it back. Right? And then the Holy Prophet Sallallahu categorically has mentioned okay, that person will be Nabiullah, Nabiullah, Nabiullah. Yeah. In one hadith he mentioned it four times. And right? Sahih Muslim. Uh, Sahih Muslim. Then his, uh, the Holy Prophet has, has said that it will be Isa ibn Maryam. That there's an explanation to that as well. You know the concept of the Imam Mahdi and Isa alayhi salam? They're coming back, right? It's accepted amongst all classical scholars. This is something which yeah. even today modern scholars will accept that he must come back because Islam needs that. We've actually received a question from Japan and it's from Malik Muazzam Hadir Abbas uh, and he says, please can you tell me, it's linked into this conversation, that's why I thought I'd bring it up. He says, please can you tell me, what do you believe about Mirza Ghulam Ahmed? Uh, is he a prophet, yeah. uh, an imam according to you? Yeah, so Malik, Malik Sob? Yeah. So Malik Sob, Jazakallah for your question. Uh, I'm glad you've tuned in and you're uh, taking direct uh, you know, answers from us. The Holy Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, peace be upon him, we believe, believe him to be a prophet of God. But what type of prophet is he? He's a prophet who is subservient to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He received his prophet, not directly from Allah Ta'ala, but by following the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentions that I am nothing without my master. And how do we prove this? Allah Ta'ala himself has says that whoever obeys Allah Ta'ala and this prophet, i.e. the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Ta'ala will bestow him upon them you know, rewards, and the greatest reward is our prophethood. Now, you read various writings of the Promised Messiah, peace be upon him, and you'll see that the love he had for Islam, for Allah Ta'ala, and most importantly for his beloved master, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so much so that once the angels of the heavens came to him and said, Hada rajulun yuhibbu Rasulullah, that this is the being that who loves the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the only Prophet by following him, you can attain the rank of Prophet of himself. This is so unique to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is the true meaning of Khatam al -Nabiyyi. So I guess the natural uh, way to take this conversation is that Muslims are waiting for the Imam Ahmadiyyan Messiah. Yeah. Um, so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of who. Yeah. Why is it then you know, they should accept Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Because all of the signs for the Mahdi and the Masih were fulfilled with Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Islam. And history now testifies to the fact, over 130 years since his claim, that all the Mahdi's, all the Masih's, everyone who made this claim has fizzled out and their own ulama accept this. But yeah. only this one Imam Mahdi and Masih, his mission continues. One thing to just differentiate here, and it's important, the Holy Prophet wasallam just gave two titles to the same person, Masih yeah. and Mahdi. In Ibn Majah, we, it's a very, very famous hadith. The Prophet wasallam said, Mal um, Mahdiyu illa Isa, that there is no Mahdi apart from Isa. And in another hadith, he spoke about Isa's return. He said he is Imaman Mahdiyan, that he is the Imam Mahdi, right? So it's one person. Now, during the time of there's lots of signs being fulfilled. For example, the great comet in 1882, the Sanin, which appeared, um, and that was in the narrations for the Mahdi and for the Masih that uh, to come. He explained what those, um, you know, the indications were about Ismahu Ismi, that his name will be my name, his father's name will be Abdullah as well. Promised Messiah alayhi salam, explained that this is just showing that I'll be very close to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa from my spiritual rank and how I will resemble his spirituality. That spirituality will fall upon me and I'll be very close to him. In fact, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, actually said in a narration of Bukhari that I am the closest to Ibn Maryam and there is laysa bayni wa baynahu nabiyun. There is no nabi between me and him. So this spiritual closeness was there. Now, one point which I want to mention, for example, is when Hazrat Mizzah Ghulam Islam claimed to be the Mahdi and the Masih, the ulama at that time, they would raise all kinds of allegations. One allegation, which was very tactful, which they raised, they said that, hang on a minute, there's a hadith in Dar Qutni which says that when the Mahdi comes, the moon will be eclipsed and the sun will be eclipsed in the month of Ramadan. Yeah. That hasn't happened. That wasn't in the... You know, the Hazrat Mizzah Ghulam Ahmed salam, couldn't have done that himself. That had to be done from Allah. He prayed, he prayed to Allah, that Allah, this is out of my power. Please manifest this sign and it happened. It happened in 1894 that the moon was eclipsed and in the same month of Ramadan, remember, yeah. 
the sun was eclipsed in the 28th of Ramadan as well. And he was the claimant. Now, in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that they, this sign has never occurred since the creation of the heavens and the earth for a certain being who has been ordained by Allah. Now, when this happened, the ulama then started rejecting the hadith. They started saying that, no, this, this hadith, you know, it's, it's weak. And, yeah. But how can you reject the hadith that has come true like the light of day? But there's so many other examples as well. But one of the things which I think is really important is just look at the history, how Allah has supported Hazrat Mizra Ghulam Ahmed Islam. And Allah says that me and my messengers will be successful. And that's exactly what's happening. It's like everything that you've mentioned, the question shouldn't be why, it should be why not. Why not, exactly. Makes sense. But one question I want to ask, do you feel that some people have find, find it difficult to accept or there's an issue with the fact that he's from India and from Punjab. And I asked this question because actually a lot of people raise allegations yeah. and you know they do it in a kind of mocking way that you know he's a prophet from Punjab. But the interesting thing is that we haven't dictated it, right? Yeah. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, you know he describes two Isas, right? One Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam and described him of, uh, from, from the Middle East, uh, you know, with, with the red fair complexion. skin, with a red complexion, with wavy hair, yeah. curly hair. And then in the very same narration, yeah. he described the Imam Mahdi, the Messiah that was to come in the latter days. And his complexion was described as someone with wheat colored skin, yeah. right? And someone who had straight hair. So we haven't, you know, Allah Ta'ala is the one that you know, chooses his prophet, chooses his messenger. And the Holy Prophet described himself who that messenger would be. And this is unique in itself that someone who came in India, remember India, you have to see the history of India as well. It was a, you know, a, a melting pot of all major religions of the world. And majority of them were far away from religion itself, from faith itself. And the Holy Prophet was chosen for that particular place. There's also that hadith which you mentioned earlier of the tafsir of Akhirina Minhum Lama Yalla Kubihim that the Holy Prophet said that this Ajami, Salman Farsi, it, this Mahdi will be from his lineage, right? He'll be Persian descent. And we know Hazrat Mizza Ghulam Ahmad was of Persian descent. But f leaving all of this aside, just the very fact that people say that we have accepted a Punjabi prophet, an Indian prophet, right? This is what the Quran mentions about other prophets, where people would say, is this the person that has been... Allah has ordained as a prophet. Is, is it him? He walks around in the streets. He walks around in the streets. Um, and, you know, he's like a normal human being yeah. or he's got nothing special about him, right? God forbid. Uh, God forbid. And the fact that the Holy Prophet ﷺ made it a clear point to mention in his farewell sermon, yeah. he said that you no know, black person has superiority. Uh, superiority over a white and vice versa as well. And he's the one who tried to get rid of this racism and this kind of looking down on other ethnicities. Just one last point. I know we, we, we're stretched for time. This was the very same allegation was made against the Holy Prophet so so. by the Jews. They said that this person, exactly, yeah. the Makkans, the disbelievers of Makkans, that if Allah Ta'ala had ordained for, for someone to come, would they choose uh, someone, a humble person like uh, the Holy Prophet Why not someone of... Uh, of Azim, the words are used in the Quran, Azim, of, of good heritage, of, of, uh, of greatness, right? So this, the, whatever, Hazim Masih Madhulayi has said one thing, that whatever allegation has been made upon me, yeah, absolutely. no other prophet is also free from those allegations, right? So I'm no different. Yeah. And for just for the record, there's thousands and thousands of Arabs who are accepting Hazim yeah. Zoghulam Abdullah Islam, a Punjabi prophet. Yeah. We received a number of questions. I'm just going to read another one we received by email from Saima Afzal. It's a two-part question. Uh, the first part is, why do former MDs leave the Jamaat if the Jamaat is true? Look, the simple thing is that if you look at the again, I want to go back to the life of the Holy Prophet There were some who were unfortunate. They, first of all, they didn't accept, it, accept the Holy Prophet but some accepted him and then went on to apostatize. So it doesn't mean that the Holy Prophet was incorrect, God forbid. The Holy Prophet has mentioned al madinatu Kalkiri. There was a whole, a few people that left Islam, you know, Muslims that left Islam. And the Holy Prophet described it that Medina is like a furnace. It gets rid of the impurities, right? Why would we want someone to stay who doesn't want to be part of us? We're not forcing anyone to stay. 
It's the same case, just because a few people, if they leave the Jamaat, that doesn't make Hazrat Masih and Sallam claim anything less than what it is. Yeah. Or it doesn't nullify the Holy Prophet Hazrat Masih and Sallam's claim. Yeah. This is just part and parcel of what happens with the lives of the Prophets and, and Jamaat. It's like the teaching, you mentioned there's no compulsion, like Rahat al-Din, that there's no compulsion in religion. But I will say one thing, there's no field in life, no club, no society that you join and you feel that you can run it your way. Like you yeah. join and if it doesn't suit you, you leave. So like you mentioned in the life of the Holy Prophet even though the Prophet is the most dearest person to us and the Muslims, the Holy Prophet was the most dearest person to us and is the most dearest person to us. People in his life rejected him and opposed him. So, You know, um, Aswan, just one thing in the Holy Quran, Allah makes mention of this on, with other Prophets as well. For example, Hazrat Nuh salam, his son rejected him. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran. That's his son, right? That's his blood. So, yeah, has a lot's wife, yeah. right? So it's yeah. not... It's not something unseen or unheard, yeah. right? It, it's, yeah. it's part and parcel of a, a divine community yeah. that people will leave. So what? Okay. All right. Uh, like I said, we're receiving a number of questions. I believe we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes. Uh, um, G. So uh, my question was, um, so Ahmadis believe that Allah can still give uh, wahi or revelation. But it's also a common belief amongst Muslims that that wahi or revelation has stopped with the Holy Prophet sallallahu um, I just want to relate this to a verse of the Quran, Surah An-Nal, chapter 16, verse 3, uh, where very briefly Allah Ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, He sends down with revelation by His command on whomsoever of His servants He pleases. So essentially, how can we prove that God still speaks today as He did before? based on this verse and any other sort of evidences that you guys might know. Jazakallah. Okay, so first, of, so first of all, to make it categorically clear, when non-Ahmadis speak about wahi and Ahmadis accepting wahi continuing, we do not accept any kind of wahi which will bring a new sharia. That's finished. It's finished with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu The Holy Quran is Khatam al-Qutub. It's the seal. No other wahi according to a new sharia will come. That being said, classical scholars have accepted that there's different levels of wahi as well. When an angel um, comes down, speaks to God's chosen servants, even believers, these are all categories of wahi. The lowest form of wahi which they accept is true dreams, ru'ya saliha. And they say only this exists now. So they are confining Allah to just being able to communicate with mankind through dreams, yeah. right? They're limiting Allah. They're saying Allah is deaf, dumb and blind now, God forbid, and he can't speak. This is where Hazim is a ghulam Ahmed Islam, not only claimed, but showed that Allah speaks today as he did before and that the Holy Quran as well makes this claim. Now we have the example of, examples of Hazim is a ghulam Ahmed Islam. We have Tadhkira. This is not our Holy Quran, right? This is just a compilation of Hazim is a ghulam Ahmed Islam's revelations, dreams and visions, none of those revelations abrogated the Holy Quran at all, right? Now, finally, we have to remember that the Holy Quran says that Allah speaks. It's one of his sifat, it's one of his attributes. For example, now I said that classical scholars, Muslim ulama accept that angels speaking to human beings and um, revealing themselves to human beings is part of wahi, right? Allah says, Inna qalu Allahu thumma That surely those people who say, Allah is our Lord and they are steadfast. Upon them, angels descend and they say, don't fear, don't be anxious. Tatanazal is a fail, which is a verb for the present and for the future. So this verse is for our time right now and it's for the future. And so how can we say the wahi doesn't continue? It's unbelievable. He mentioned, the, the caller mentioned Surah Nahal, right? Surah Nahal mentions yeah. of the bee, right? And Allah says that I revealed unto the bee as well, unto the honeybee. So if Allah Ta'ala is revealing unto the honeybee and we're meant to be Ashraful Makhlukat, the best of creation, humans, and we're not receiving wahi, we're not receiving guidance from God Almighty, we're not having communion with God Almighty. How does that make sense, right? So don't, again, my humble advice to our non ahmadi Muslim brethren is, don't make our Quran into a jest. Yeah. Don't make our teachings into a jest for your own personal vendetta against the Jamaat. You know, right? this, by saying Allah doesn't speak, it proves the argument of the atheists. 
Nietzsche said that God's dead in 1900. And other Muslims have to accept God is dead. If God can only give revelation or communicate through mankind through dreams and you don't accept any other kind of way, any kind of communication, then you have a dead faith. And this is where Hazim Mizzah Ghulam Ahmed Islam said that I have come to show Allah exists and Ahmadis have endless endless experiences and um, incidents where they've yeah. experienced Allah through these different forms of wahi. All right, we're, like we said, we received a number of questions. We're now just going to go through a quick fire round. Uh, we received another question, if we could please hear what that is. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, just a question for the panel today. Um, one of the major allegations against the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in general and its founder in particular is that Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, was an agent of the British. And this is a question that comes up again and again as a kind of alternative hypothesis as to why um, uh, he has been so successful. Um, in particular, they're saying that he's, they've always said that he's been supported by the British and that was why he was so successful. Um, so if you could please some, shed some light on that question, why was the... Why were the opponents of Ahmadi Islam, um, why did they raise the allegation that he is uh, an agent of the British? And also, is it an adequate explanation for why he has been so successful? Jazakallah, thank you. We've received another question. It's very similar to this. I'm just going to read it out for, on our, from WhatsApp. Uh, the question is that non-Ahmadi Muslims say that Ahmadiyyat was created by the British Empire to cause fitna within the Ummah. One example they present is that Ahmadiyyat is progressing in non-Muslim countries only and not in Muslim countries. If you could very quickly just answer this question. Okay, this, there's so many answers. But first of all, remember during the time of Hazim Mizzah Ghulam Ahmad Islam, these Muslim ulama were going to the British government and they were saying that this Mahdi is going against you. He's going to rebel against you. And now today, the tables have turned. They're like, oh no, actually they're British yeah. agents. The reason why they perplexed about this and it's because they've seen there's a lone man in Qadian, right? He's got no support, physical support, financial support. He, everyone's against him. The Christians, the Muslims, the Hindus are all fighting against him. And yet he succeeds and succeeds and succeeds. For them, there's no explanation to this apart from that he was funded by the British uh, Empire, God forbid. Whereas the British Empire, the only reason Hazrat Mizzah Ghulam Ahmad Islam praised them fundamentally is because they were giving religious freedom at the time. Yes. He, during his time, actually, someone said, you're a British appeaser, right? He said, how can I be a British appeaser when I have completely dismantled the faith of the British government? All these officers who are in British uh, India, they believe in Christianity and I have written books upon books dismantling the faith of Christianity. Just as a final point, which I think is really important to mention and actually I want to address all the Western Muslim youth who are listening to this. Look at the history of the Sunni ulama in India at the time. They were all praising the British Empire, especially for this um, relig religious freedom. One example I want to give is Darul Uloom Nadwatul Ulama. When Darul Uloom Nadwatul Ulama started this uh, seminary for ulama of the Sunnis, they called the British Lieutenant John Hewitt to the ceremony of the foundation stone, made him lay the foundation stone, and in that they said to him in a speech that we thank you and you coming here is a testimony to the British fairness. fairness. They also said that we thank you for the 500 reprieves that you're giving us every single month. They were being funded by the British. This is the state of the ulama and their institutions, whereas Hazim Mizzah Ghulam Ahmad Islam never took a penny from the British. He only praised the British because they were giving freedom of religion and all other ulama were doing that as well and they were going further actually. In fact, he invited the Queen to Islam. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm going to, before I read the next question, again, it's just something that's been mentioned that the, these allegations, they recycle themselves. We yeah, hear these do. again and again, and there's answers for these available online. And these are such petty points, points that can't really affect your faith in any way. But again, the next uh, question that we received, um, it's similar. It's about Muhammad Begum. Um, and it's, can you answer me why taqdire mubrim in the Muhammad Begum prophecy was not fulfilled, despite the prophecy clearly stating no one can stop it? So close, man. Um, it, there's a real uh, backstory to the Muhammad Begum yeah. uh, prophecy, but one element that the Promised Messiah Alayhi was mentioned was that that if this individual, this man, uh, Ahmed Beg, 
if he does not follow. Basically, they were all against Islam. They were against the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were using foul languages. So the Holy Promised Messiah laced out Islam. He sought God's guidance because they were demanding a sign. So Allah Ta'ala showed the sign that, look, this woman needs to be married to you, right? Just as has a soda and, um, you know, and other wives of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were able to kind of appease their nations mm. through this marriage. This is the way that these, this, these people can be safeguarded. So anyway, Hazul prayed, he got a, a sign and he published that sign. And eventually he said that if you do not marry this woman to me, right, the father will die within three years and whoever she gets married to, she, they will die within two and a half years. This was Taqdeer al mubrim right? This was the inevitable Taqdeer that will happen. What happened was that the man, the father, he did, he didn't oblige with the prophecy, he perished within three years. But the person that Muhammad Begum did get married to, he repented. And the whole family repented after seeing that their father had perished, the whole family repented and they were able to kind of um, avert this prophecy and uh, you know, work in their favour. And what happened in return? That that prophecy was limited to that family alone. They all accepted, yeah. right? And people of that family accepted the promise of Messiah as well. Yeah. So those people that were the prophecy was made about and were shown signs for, yeah, exactly. they had no issues with it. Yeah. But now we're saying 130 years later, we're critiquing it for some reason. Again, it's a distraction. It's a distraction from the theology and the powerful argument of which Hazrat Mizzul Ghulam Islam gave for his truthfulness. And everyone does this with all different prophets. And you can do that you know, all day, all along. Uh, Father, I want to ask you a question. Last week, someone asked us, um, give us one sign of your truthfulness, and you mentioned Khilafat. Yeah. Um, and at the beginning of the show, we mentioned that the world is going towards destruction, and yeah. His Holiness, the fifth caliph of the MDM Muslim community, over the last number of years yeah. has warned us. Why would non ahmadis take heed to that warning? Why is that so important, what His Holiness has said? Look, we believe our Khalifa is guided by Allah. Allah established Khilafat Ahmadiyya, like He khla established Khilafat after the Holy Prophet so that should be enough for someone else to believe in the Khalifa and what he's saying. Now, what's interesting is for the last 20 years, our Khalifa has been going all across the world to the most influential people in the world, to the most influential institutions in the world, whether that's Capitol Hill, the European Parliament, the British Parliament, the parliaments in New Zealand and in Australia, um, so many different places. And he's been warning the world about the current situation of the world, where we're heading towards a World War III, right? Now, when he was doing this 20 years ago, we started off, I still remember just, you know, it was 20, a very long time ago, but I still remember people saying that he's just fear-mongering, right? He's, there's no such thing as a world war. Yeah. Almost 20 years on, what are we seeing? The whole world, all the analysts, everyone is saying that we're on the brink of a war. And this, the reason why he was warning is because he has true empathy for mankind. He doesn't want destruction. He doesn't want people to fight. He doesn't want, you know, basically the end of mankind today. And another aspect, which is really crucial to remember, is that Hazrat Muslim Masruh, may Allah be his helper, has been giving Islamic solutions to the world problems. So he goes to Capitol Hill, he goes to the British Parliament, he goes to the European Union um, Parliament, and he tells them that these are the Islamic solutions for the world problems today. This is how the Holy Prophet ﷺ ruled over the um, city of Medina as a statesman. These are the different aspects which he implemented, and that's how peace was created. Usually, Muslim leaders, they go and they seek something from these yeah. big institutions, right? Or big parliamentarians. And uh, there's been cases within the community as well. They're like, oh, what, what can we do for you? They're like, you can't do anything yeah. for us. We're here for you. Yeah. We're giving you something, right? So heed to this message, right? Look, and they're heeding, right? Non-Muslims, right? They are listening to the Caliph. They're listening to the Khalifa. But unfortunately, the Muslim Ummah, right? They're not. And what's happening is we're, we're, going, we're, we're worse off than 20 years ago. Yeah, exactly. Right? Because we're rejecting the promised Messiah and not listening to the words of his chosen Khalifa. But those that are, they're coming into the fold of Islam Ahmadiyyat and they're seeing revolution in their lives. And this revolution, like Usman, we've been mentioning, we mentioned this last week and this week again, is not that you know, we're going to drive a better car, we're going to have a bigger house. It's that inner peace, yeah. that connection with God Almighty, this is what Khilafat establishes. They turn, they turn fear into peace. True Khalifa. Yeah. They establish faith to the true Khalifa. Yeah. 
what is Hazrat Mirza Masoori Ahmed, may Allah strengthen his hand, doing? He's looking eye to eye with these parliamentarians and saying like, what you guys are doing is wrong. What you guys are doing is unjust. Listen to me. If you do not, then God's wrath will be incurred. And, and empathy, even every Friday sermon is like, pray for humanity. Yeah. May Allah's grace and mercy fall upon humanity because what we're doing, we're standing on the edge of doom. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, last week, under the divine leadership of our beloved Khalifa, we gave you some real-life stats, facts and real examples as to how the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat spreads the beautiful teachings of Islam and how we honour and propagate the message of the Holy Quran and how we illustrate the noble character of our beloved Master, the Holy Prophet And we asked you to please tell us what you have done as a collective Ummah, what have you guys done with regards to the service of Islam and making the world a better place through Islam. Now, we were flooded with messages across all of our social media platforms, yet not a single person could answer the question. We had comments in which people were calling us kafir, you had time to call, send lanat on us, but you couldn't share us any one example of how you have served and benefited the world through Islam. But anyway, today we're going to set you another task. We're going to give you another simple question, and please try to answer it. The question is, and the challenge is, that check any of our social media platforms. Go through all of our books and materials. Watch any of our MTA channels. Find, if you can, a single post, real video, or a single page, or even a single sentence that is derogatory and against the teachings of Islam or the Holy Prophet Wasallam. and bring it forward. This is our challenge. See if you can prove us wrong. And do this before the next program. Bring forward what you have. And inshallah, we'll see you next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. نزل المهدي فينا مرحبا شمس الزمان فأقام الدين شرعا للذي يبقى